Remember, next week is the last chance you'll have to finalize your preparation for the practical. The elderly Chauvanti Mel said. He was the professor in charge of teaching practicable battlefield tactics in the modern era of capital ships, and he took his job seriously. You will each be individually graded for your actions during the test, and for those who haven't been doing their research, I know who you are, the practical is a simulated strike mission. You will jump to and then engage an enemy fleet to prevent it from attacking a planet. You have full operational control, and instructors will not be holding your hands. You will, once again, be graded on personal performance. I expect to see competence and proper strategic planning. The final practical exam of the Patrol Academy was something all pilots have been looking forward to. Aside from a physical flight where the pilots would escort a convoy inside deep shore space, this exercise was one of the few true training events where reality was factored in. Unlike massive dogfights, ambushes or other fake engagements, this battle would have no thought spared in how it would handle the engagements. The fleets were simple. The patrol class and their escort ships versus a captain with a fleet size of their choosing. The captains were instructed to equip their fleet like they would if they were invading a planet, and the patrol would only have what they could scramble for said planet's defence. They could stand and fight, or retreat to collect their strength. But if they lost, they all lost. Milk and Cookie stood on opposite sides of a room, heavy fly suits padding their bodies as helmets rest over their heads. They stared into each other's eyes, weapons held at their sides, in low ready. They smiled manic grins as they brought up their borrowed swords and brought down the gravity. Inside the training center, there were rooms where the gravity's intensity, direction and everything else could be manipulated. It was normally used for training sailors for movement in ships where the main core might have been damaged, or for EVA drills without the impending fear of death in the void. Like many training rooms, Cadets could sign them out for personal reasons so long as an instructor signed off on the use. When Milk and Cookie walked up to Senwim with massive smiles on their faces and a request to use the variable gravity room, she expected it was an event that would require a deep cleaning by the janitors afterwards. After it was explained, all she requested was to watch. Their drill matron blew a silvery whistle and the pair rocketed at each other. Under normal gravity, the pair were capable of sprinting at around 20 miles per hour, but not for long. Under near zero gravity, they dashed across the ground like figures in a Wuxia film. The first time their source met was nearly the last, as Newton's third law reared its gloriously ugly head, and sent the pair spiralling off into the low gravity room and slamming into the walls before reorientating themselves on the floor. Semwin provided a respectful clap. Singular. There was another party held in the patrol barracks. One last hurrah before finals crunch began, and everyone stressed out like nothing else. It was time to dance. Milk and Cookie were late to the party, but as they walked closer, familiar sounds began to emanate from the hijacked multipurpose room. Familiar words. Someone was playing Dropkick Murphys. Milk threw the doors open, Boss and Irish calling to Boss and Irish, and she saw THE other human in the academy standing behind a makeshift DJ stand blowing music at maximum volume. She was a Polish lady who had travelled the world before the Chauvanti invaded, and took the invasion as an opportunity to see the galaxy. She and Milk ended up talking for a bit when they had to talk with the medicals at the same time due to menstrual issues, and the Pole had an odd way of thinking about the occupation. To quote her opinions of the whole mess, I'm Polish. Making a big deal out of being occupied by a hostile power for us is like someone making a big deal out of it being February. The wink and the whistling of Chopti Singh Jaik Slal had Milk wondering how true the sentiment really was. Milk idly sang along with Rose Tattoo as she walked over to where Ventures Forth was once again serving drinks. What do you have for me? She asked the cyborg, who was wearing a name tag identifying her as Ventures in Froth. Something good. Sixteen Royal Engineers are passing through, and they brought a good haul of Cambrian whiskey. Cambrian? So we've got dinosaurs now? Milk asked with a raised eyebrow. Each of my homeworld had reptilian megafauna. We called them dinosaurs. Guess there are only so many sounds you can make? Guess so. Either way, mad bastards to the last. Did you know they're the only shield colony that wasn't reconquered during the Wars of Refusal? Milk thought for a second. I think I heard about that. Wait, second, third refusal? Something about being too hard to take? Ventures forth grinned. Too hard to take, let's put it this way. If you listen to the stories the Cambrians tell, they invented the first anti-orbital defense system because the constant orbital bombardments were annoying their elderly. That's the type of shit they like to talk about themselves. 
Even in modern days, the colony flag is the only one allowed to fly at the same height as the Imperial one. Any merit to those stories? Well, they've got standard conscription, and their defences are theoretically the equal to shields without use of a home fleet. Venturesworth continued. It shows that, if you can't dig a proper trench by eight, you've grown up in the wrong system. Cadians, Ilk thought. We found the Shilvanti Cadians. But that doesn't matter. What does matter is that they've got the best whiskey around. I heard one Imperial birthday they gave the Empress a bottle of the stuff, buried by her ancestors' orbital fire during the First War of Refusal. The only other colony with a claim like that is the Vastotav, and they still technically struck their colours at the end of the War of Refusal. Cambria was more or less independent for a good couple decades there before the Shil figured out orbital fire, and they sued for peace. The Shil, not the Cambrians. Losing ships to anti-orbital fire was getting too expensive. Milk whistled. I ain't got a cold ball rex shit on that, but that seems like some grade A propaganda right there. Forth shrugged. Propaganda or not, hell of an independent story. I should tell you about the many independent stories Earth has, Milk comments, grabbing one of the whiskies from the table. You have multiple. You know, that explains so much, Forth replies with a laugh. There's a nation that can't go six days without a country celebrating kicking them out. We're a rowdy bunch and prone to fighting. Thundering war drums, a bagpipe being tuned to sound, and an electric guitar rolled across the crowd as the real McKenzie's song about Bill Millen's mad bastardry roared out. Speaking of rowdy and prone to fighting, she grinned and took a swig of the bottle. I think someone needs to learn how to properly interact with men. The Irish lass grabbed an empty bottle from off the makeshift bar and stalked over to a trio of shill, calling a Rakiri man off in the dark part of the room. She found herself joined by a handful of other folks before the brawl began. It was quite fun. It was quite fun. The sword fighting, at least. The pilot and WSO danced off each other, blades clashing in time as they used the low gravity to their advantage, pulling off moves normally seen aided with wires and CGI. They danced in zero-g, clashing with sparking blades and shining steel, jumping and leaping and twirling and soaring in the air. Beauty held movement and motion. They didn't speak, didn't think, didn't feel. All they did was act to the beat of an unheard song, strike to ancient drums, and parry to cunning flutes. Primal glory held in flashing cutlasses. Naval tradition, long lost, relearned by those two oviators of space. A small crowd had joined, watching the pair dance and duel in the space between. An old child of Sevastotav stood silently, watching the pair dance as one for the unseen audience. Perhaps, she thought. Perhaps. It's been eight years since the invasion and the perps still haven't cleaned up their shit? A construction worker grumbled. Instead, they make us to it. At least we're getting paid, the overseer responded. Osha Yellow Jack is a safe place of colour against the parking garage's rubble. And being paid well. Also, you're in a goddamn mech suit. The hell are you complaining about? They don't have AC in this damn thing, the worker called back. Osha regulations mandating that the construction exo be fully sealed when working in demolitions. They like their suits toasty, but I am baking in this thing. Maybe Mackenzie wasn't an idiot for going in naked. No, she was an idiot. But she was a well-chilled idiot before something Jab where I shouldn't. You're not allowed to take your shirt off. I'll see about getting you a fan or something, but consider it an extra incentive to get your work done fast. Yeah, yeah, fuck you, Paul, the worker replied, slowly moving rubble, concrete and rebar to the disposal area. What's this place even going to be used for? Public transport's worth it, you know. I actually sold my damn car. I don't think they'll rebuild a parking garage. The overseer looked up at the worker. You sold your car? Huh. I remember you talking a lot about getting one ten years ago. Ten years ago, it was shorter to walk across Long Island than take a bus. Now I'm across the city before the train would have arrived in the old world. Was that Mussolini quote? At least you made the trains run on time or something? Yeah, bullshit. Those fascists couldn't know public infrastructure if it bid them. What made the trains run on time were the socialists and unions all spaghetti bowl didn't want to kill. Solidarity forever, even under empire. The worker laughed. No kidding, but yeah, I think I'm almost a boss. The instant snapping tone of voice shook the overseer out of idle amusement. What's wrong? Call the cops. We've got a body. She's a perp, in armor. Interior sash. Fuck. And so with this last report, we can move on to the reek stake of this debrief. Ah yes, the real reason Captain Rochelle preferred to be in her ship. When she was off her ship, people with delusions of adequacy and possible aspirations of not half bad, tended to try and give her briefings on their most recent action to try and curry favour. 
and since she was Captain Rochelle, she couldn't blow them off as much as she wanted to. The reputation she cultivated where she actually listened to her crew and subordinates was too delicate to risk on something as stupid as leaving boring briefings. So I would advise you to use a mixed group of frigates along with a bombardment vessel in order to accurately threaten the planet in question. Ah, there it was. This jumped up officer, whose only claim to fame was her last name, wanted to advise her on how to create a proper fleet for the practical test, trying to show off her encyclopedic knowledge of tactical situations while worshipping the capital ship, and all because the simulated planet was that new one everyone was talking about. You want to bring the bombardment vessel because the planet in question is known for still having red zones? So in order to instill proper fuel and discipline quickly, you'll need to hit the enemy with overwhelming force to make them too afraid to stand against you. Did that work previously? Rochelle finally spoke up. Her Zavastatavan accent turning the low drawl into almost a growl as she looks the rookie officer in the eye. The last I checked, Earth is still having insurrection issues in part because the initial fleet decided the best way to conquer a world is through military force. I would remind you that doesn't always work. The captain reached off to her side and took a sip of the water she brought with her. The other officers had been sampling the provided 16th Royal Whiskey, or Red Vine. She preferred to keep a sober head during meetings like this. It helped with her image and allowed her to avoid free and counting poisoning attempts. Speaking as a Sylvester Taven, of course, Rochelle finishes, pushing her natural accent to near stereotypical levels. The officer up front blushed, flushed, and sputtered in disbelief at Captain Rochelle's interjection. A Cambrian army officer piped up. Speaking as someone with similar experiences regarding history and the Imperium, I second her motion. The 16th Royal Engineers Major gave Captain Rochelle a nod, one she couldn't return because, once again, reputation. Sometimes Rochelle really wondered if it was worth it, keeping up all these airs, but then she remembered the first time the crew saw the clay-hearted bitch turn an ambush into a battle, into a rout, because she stood firm and didn't break. The crew needed that stability, that rock of rocks to anchor themselves on. The reputation was more important than the fact. The fact that reputation also allowed her to talk back to her supposed betters didn't hurt. So I'll ask you again, Junior Lieutenant Sukela. What makes you think that the orbital bombardment vessel would change the minds of a people who have been hit with orbital strikes before and seem to have just found it insulting? The Junior Lieutenant sputtered for a bit before our commanding officer told the truly Julia officer to sit down. If there are no more points to be observed, Rochelle began, and has seen everyone confirming the negative. I believe this meeting is over. Dismissed. She stood and turned to the door. The Major from the 16th Royal stood up and followed her out. Well, that was a clusterfuck, she muttered. I mean, I'm army, but that fleet composition looked like it had so many holes. No skirmish line to deal with forces if you get in a standing fight. No ships would get up and go to the keep of the enemy from pounding on your heavier vessels during a near-sea flight. And that's not even touching on how she decided that the artillery piece would be your flagship. Rochelle nodded. I like the soldiery gait and exuberant hand motions of the army major. The captain clasped her hands behind her back as she strove forward with purpose. You are not incorrect. The fleet she described would be proper as an anchor point to a larger maneuver or as a punitive fleet. Something big and scary to force someone to kneel. But we know how well that works, said the officer whose corp could trace their lineage back to a time when she was ruled by queens and whose corps had been declared dead multiple times only to be found months to years later still fighting even after being nuked. We know exactly how well that works, said the woman whose homo considered themselves simply held by contract to an Imperium they could throw off any day if someone got enough people around for a vote. 